and thank you very much for um, organising these seminar series. I've really enjoyed um, uh, attending um, them and uh, seeing people, uh, familiar faces and new faces, uh, been, been really great. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about um, a couple of problems concerning phytoplankton in flow uh, and associated with the role of shape. So the two problems I'm going to talk about, um, firstly, um, I'm going to be looking at how uh, phytoplankton sink uh, in flow fields. And then secondly, I'm going to look about how uh, phytoplankton swim uh, in flows. Um, so the sinking uh, problem, um, this uh, came about uh, through interactions, uh, particularly with uh, Luca Brandt and Leacott Boss um, at one of the uh, cost action uh, networks a few years ago. Um, and then it developed into a project uh, with Martin Bees and uh, an MSc student of mine, Will Clifton, um, whose picture I put down at the bottom there. Um, and then the second project uh, has uh, been an uh, interaction with Mac Durham, who's now currently in Sheffield, um, and uh, he uh, did some nice work um, looking at uh, gyrotactic microorganisms uh, moving through turbulence, and we were interested in exploring uh, some of the kind of fundamental mechanisms in shear flow, um, and this was uh, in um, collaboration, I had a master's student um, who worked on this, Kieran Hursthouse, and Mac and I are working on uh, finishing off this work at the moment. And I'd just like to recognise that uh, the role that this um, bioactive uh, special interest group as part of the UK Fluids Network has played. So um, uh, Martin and I interacted at, at some of these networks regarding the first project, uh, and I very much appreciate opportunities to, to interact with members of the community. All of these uh, projects have very much been collaborative efforts. So the first problem um, is thinking about phytoplankton sinking in turbulence. So these are some images of uh, mostly diatom chains. Uh, they're single cells that can form chains that sink through the water column and slightly heavier than the fluid. Um, and one of the sort of classic paradigms that sometimes heard about in the biological oceanography community is that the role of turbulence is to mix up these um, sinking plankton, phytoplankton, um, to keep them up in the top layers of the water where they can undergo photosynthesis. Um, but coming from a sort of more of a fluids background, this has always seemed a little bit odd to me because if turbulence can mix things up, it can also mix things down. Um, and more recent work um, has, uh, through experiments and numerical simulation, has, has tried to examine in more detail um, the, the sinking rates of plankton um, through the, the water column and the role that elongation has on this. Um, and observations have been that actually being um, uh, more elongated can actually cause particles to sink more rapidly. Um, and this has got important implications for things like um, carbon cycles and the, the idea of the sort of biological pump of carbon being uh, sedimenting down uh, in, in through the water column. So the governing equations that I'm going to be looking at are quite, quite simple. Um, the position of a particle um, is going to be uh, going to change due to the fluid velocity u and the sinking speed of the particle vs, which will depend upon its orientation p. Um, so p will be changing um, uh, due to this uh, equation for low Reynolds number flows, these Jeffrey orbits, um, just a little uh, a cartoon of, of this uh, um, rotation. So uh, elongated particles will rotate uh, in the presence of shear flow, uh, but they do so non-uniformly. Um, and what you see from the cartoon is that they spend um, longer, when they're a longer time, more time aligned in the direction of the fluid uh, flow. So that's just something to bear in mind throughout this talk. Um, so once we have the orientation, we can work out the sinking velocity um, and we just take it to be a simple linear combination of the minimum sinking speed that a particle will have when it's broadside on and the maximum sinking speed when it's sinking end on. Um, and EG is just a unit vector pointing downwards. So there are governing equations. Now in um, simulations done uh, with Luca Brandt's lab, 
um, led by Luca Brandt lab doing direct numerical simulation of turbulence, um, I just want to highlight a couple of observations that they made. So first one, um, we're looking in these plots uh, of the aspect ratio of the particle. Um, so as we move to larger aspect ratios, that corresponds to the alpha parameter tending towards one in the previous slide. And we are plotting here, well, the, the, in the plot, there's the uh, fluid vertical velocity. So this is the um, uh, velocity experienced by the, the cell. Um, and also the uh, particle settling velocity against aspect ratio. So what we see here is that as, we, as the cells become more slender, um, they're spending more time in the downwelling flow. So the average vertical velocity that they experience, fluid velocity, um, becomes more negative. So they're spending more time in downwelling flow. Um, and we also see that as we increase the aspect ratio, the um, sinking velocity, Vs, the speed at which they sink in the fluid, is increased. So these two factors will cause them to sediment more in turbulence. And we wanted to understand this a little bit more um, in terms of the mechanisms of this by rather than just looking at turbulence, looking also at some simple lamia, lamina flows. Um, so as I mentioned, I had an MSc student who we did some, we decided to explore some simulations of this. Um, we started with uh, Kuwet flow, and I'm going to build up to slightly more complicated flows. Uh, and I think this gives us good insight into the mechanism for this enhanced sedimentation. So here's a little movie of, of the cell. So we've got, this is vertical Kuwet flow, um, linear shear, and we start the particle up um, here at the origin. And the particle rotates around um, and sinks uh, through the fluid. Um, and it's spending more time aligned with the fluid uh, and um, rotates around as it goes. Um, so this is a plot of this um, behavior. Um, so this is a particle starting horizontally at zero, zero. Um, and it's moving into the uh, downwelling flow. Uh, this is a particle starting at zero, zero in the vertical orientation. Um, and it will rotate into the upwelling flow. And in both of these cases, what we see is that um, the particles are spending more time in the downwelling or less upwelling flow. Um, and it's, it's quite a natural um, consequence of the way that they rotate, uh, spending more time um, aligned vertically, um, and the anisotropic drag as they um, sink through the water column. Um, also, there's some uh, simple plots of what's happening in horizontal flow. Uh, the cells in this case just rotate around, spending most of their time aligned in the horizontal direction. And we can do a little bit of analysis of what's happening in the sinking speed of these particles. So if we are in just simple vertical shear flow, so uh, J here, we're just working in XY plane, J is a unit vector upwards. Um, then uh, thinking of uh, P, our unit vector uh, of the orientation, we can compute what the total sinking velocity is of a particle analytically. Um, and it's a combination, the total sinking velocity is a combination of the um, advection by the fluid, this minus gamma X term, and the, the sinking velocity. So this um, is a function of theta, the angle, um, which will be varying over time. And we can compute what the average sinking velocity is by averaging over a complete Jeffrey orbit. And when we compute this, uh, do this, undertake this calculation, um, what we find is that this sinking velocity only depends on the aspect ratio and the initial orientation of the cell. It doesn't affect, isn't affected by the shear rate itself. Um, and just to note that uh, the parameter here, SR, um, it's just a non-dimensionalized uh, parameter, sorry, it's just a, a well, a non-dimensional value um, relating the maximum and minimum sinking speeds. And these total sinking velocities are non-dimensionalized on what the isotropic sink rate of the particle would be in still fluid. So um, as I said, that, I, I haven't shown the, the algebra, it's a little bit messy, but you can get those analytic results out. 
and you can plot them and compare them with some numerical simulations. So these are simulations looking at what is the sedimentation speed of particles. And we can look at it in vertical shear and we can look at it in horizontal shear. So there's two components to this sedimenting speed. There's um, a component which is enhanced um, because of alignment and direction of the flow. So this light gray part tells us that as we get longer and thinner, um, because we tend to align with the direction of the flow, uh, then in vertical shear, we're aligning upwards, so sink more rapidly, whereas in horizontal shear, we're aligning horizontally and sink more slowly. So those in some sense are kind of equal and opposite. Uh, they would kind of cancel each other out, uh, I guess, if you were in turbulence. Um, but in, in a 2D case, as I say, we see this enhancement in vertical and decline in horizontal. But on top of that, in vertical shear, you have a preferential sampling of the downflow. They tend to spend more time in that downflowing region. So we get this extra enhancement um, of, the, of the vertical sedimenting speeds. And uh, these results are all independent of what the shear strength is. Um, so uh, just to reiterate that the lines, the, the calculated lines are the analytic and then was just some simulations where we just threw a whole bunch of bugs in with random initial orientations uh, and computed their average sedimenting speeds, which agree nicely with the analytic results. Um, so then we went on to consider somewhat more realistic flows. So uh, the, the flow we looked at next was this Kolmogorov flow. So it's uh, non-uniform shear. Um, just a, a but vertical. Um, so uh, these are some example simulations of the what's happening in this shear flow. Um, so uh, we're looking at some different initial conditions. So in this first example, uh, we're starting at the origin, horizontally located, um, and the shear will cause this cell to rotate around. It almost reaches its vertical position and then it swings back to horizontal, and then it reverses when it comes back in the other direction. Sorry. So it's swinging back and forth. And if we do that on the phase portrait of that, if we compare the horizontal position against the uh, theta, the orientation, we get these closed orbits, um, these swinging um, trajectories. In contrast, if we started with another initial condition, so vertically downwards um, at the origin, then we just have um, what I call this swaying motion where the um, uh, orientation doesn't change all that much across the, or across the trajectory. So it just has a slight sway. Uh, and in the phase portrait, we can see this by this closed loop here where there's very little change in the orientation theta um, but a more substantial change in the horizontal position. And then the final behavior is what we've called this tumbling behavior, where uh, the cell undergoes complete orbits, um, rather like the um, Kuwait flows. Uh, and uh, this is seen by here, these, these lines that go through, uh, dividing up the phase plane. Um, so we found this was quite interesting. And there's similarities uh, with the work that Zoltan Stark did on swinging and tumbling in Poise flow. Um, but we have this additional, um, identified this additional motion, this swaying motion. So that was in the vertical Kolmogorov flow. Um, if we increase the shear, uh, we, get slightly, we, we, we get slightly different behaviors. So increasing the shear, uh, the, the cell, because it is rotating more rapidly, effectively um, now sees more of a uniform shear. Um, and so we mostly get tumbling behavior. And in contrast, if we reduce the shear, uh, we move more to the um, uh, swinging behavior. And then if we look at what this means in terms of the sedimenting speed, what we find is that, again, as we increase the aspect ratio, we get enhanced sedimentation. And as we increase the shear rate, um, we tend to approach our result of the shear independent Kuwait flow. So as I mentioned, this larger value of gamma 
cells experience what looks like almost constant shear. So that explains why this increase tends towards this, this result of the no shear case. Um, in terms of what that means for accumulation of cells in certain regions, um, because the cells tend to move towards the downflow region, uh, so if we can see this in this picture here, they spend more time on the left hand side, um, we find that in the Kuwait flow, sorry, in the Kolmogorov flow, cells tend to accumulate in the regions of maximal downflow. So this will be around the um, uh, minus pi by two uh, is where we'll get the maximum downflow in that Kolmogorov. And we see accumulation in the downflow um, in, our, in our simulations where we throw in a whole bunch of bugs. So that was the vertical Kolmogorov. Um, now, I thought that was the interesting case and the horizontal would be, would be very dull, uh, but reviewers asked us to look at that and I was glad they did um, because we, we identified a kind of a new mechanism for getting um, horizontal layers forming through this uh, variable sedimentation. So let me talk you through the horizontal Kolmogorov flow. Um, so uh, in hor hor horizontal flow, we're now plotting in these uh, six uh, upper plots here, we've just got the trajectories x against y. And um, say if we look at this panel in the top middle, um, we're seeing high shear gamma is 5, high aspect ratio as AR is 20. Starting from vertical, the cells track very closely uh, the orientation um, of the direction of the trajectory when we put that in shear. So in terms of the phase portrait, when we plot theta, the orientation against y, um, we see these uh, quite strong curvy lines going through the phase trajectory. In contrast, if we start with cells being horizontal, they very much stay horizontal with this strong shear um, uh, behavior. And so we get this almost vertical line going through the phase portrait. Um, and we can explore other values of shear, other values of the aspect ratio. So for example, in this plot F, um, we can see a bit more how the varying shear is causing these cells to rotate back and forth um, and so forth. Um, so what does this mean in terms of the, the transport and accumulation? So the vertical sedimenting speed, um, this lower line is what we found for Kuwait flow. Um, so this was the sheer independent result for how sedimenting speed reduced uh, because basically cells spend more time aligned horizontally, so sink more slowly. Um, and what we see is that as we increase our uh, shear, our gamma uh, parameter, um, cells experience effectively more and more like uniform shear locally. Um, and so the sedimenting speed tends towards this asymptotic result. Well, that's moderately interesting, um, but uh, what I found then uh, really made this worthwhile was looking at what the vertical distribution of cells is. So here we've got a histogram of the cells as position Y, and as, we, as a cell drops through the water column, um, it will experience a variation in the vertical sedimenting speed. So um, here, for example, at y is pi, it will experience maximum shear. Um, where it's maximum shear, we, under, we can see from our calculations down at the bottom that maximum shear will be minimum sedimenting speed. So as we increase the shear, we reduce the sedimenting speed. So because we're reducing the sedimenting speed, we see an accumulation of cells. Um, so this accumulation uh, gives us these layering, uh, which, which have been observed in, in water column, but this, this mechanism, as far as we know about this differential sedimenting of rods, uh, seems, to be, seems to be new. Okay, um, the final example I want to give in this first part of the talk is uh, some cellular flow. So this is a bit like the Taylor Green vortices. Um, and we've got some example simulations going through cellular flow. Uh, these are the spheres uh, just sinking uh, through. Um, here's higher aspect ratio of rods, and this is a higher shear and higher aspect ratio. And we start to see some chaotic trajectories where depending on your orientation, um, your, there's divergence in um, the, the 
end positions. Uh, the grey and the black just correspond to either starting with horizontal or vertical orientation. Um, so uh, one thing which was quite interesting with these complex flows is what's happened in terms of circulation region. So for spheres, uh, we find that um, there is a retention zone that emerges at sufficiently high uh, shear. Um, so 100% of the cells uh, are within the stay within the retention zone for the duration of the simulation in this example. Um, and we see these recirculating regions. Whereas as you make, as you increase the aspect ratio, oh, sorry, as you increase the aspect ratio, uh, these retention zones um, uh, reduce and um, cells spend less time in this zone um, and increasing the aspect ratio again we get even less cells uh, going staying in this in this retention zone um, we also see when we look at uh, this is the x and y plane um, uh, the the green circles are the regions where we have the down flowing in our um, simulation and what we find in the downflowing region is there's a higher density of cells, so that's the darker colours. Um, and if we look at the vertical velocity UY um, against uh, the density of cells, uh, we can see that there's this uh, negative correlation. So there's um, more cells at these low velocities um, where they're sinking. And this uh, results in the sinking velocity uh, being an increasing function of aspect ratio and also an increasing function of shear. So to summarize this first part of the talk, um, what we found is that the slender shape uh, leads to non-uniform rotation. Um, and this leads in a peak in the orientation distribution in the direction of the flow. As, and combining that with the fact that there's the anisotropic drag means they cells spend longer in this downwelling region and we get enhanced sedimentation. And we also found that um, this uh, variation, um, it, sorry, this is about longer in downwelling flow and enhanced sedimentation. And then we also found that because of this variation in shear um, and regions were, and, and cells are not undergoing complete uh, uh, Jeffrey orbits all the time, um, you get this variation in vertical sedimentation speed and therefore accumulation in these higher shear regions. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the, the second part, which is some new work um, that uh, we're trying to get written up now and I'd very much value any feedback or comments that people have on this work. Um, so this is work uh, I'll be talking about that I'm doing with Matt Durham, um, and it was very much motivated by some work uh, that uh, uh, was published last year, looking at um, swimming uh, elongated uh, cells, gyrotactic cells in turbulence. So there are many phytoplankton cells that, that swim and are elongated. Um, we also can get chains of cells that swim. So um, here's some phytoplankton swimming cells uh, that are bottom heavy, um, so they tend to swim upwards, um, but form, form chains. Um, and this could also have applications to uh, kind of these sort of more micro robots, um, such as these um, magnetic, the magnetic head swimmer, a uh, little micro robot. Um, so if there's an external force uh, that cells tend to align towards um, and are, are you know, preferred direction, that the, the equations are very similar to these gyrotactic swimmers. So the governing equations are very similar to the uh, sedimenting um, uh, equations that we saw a moment ago. Uh, cells move because of the uh, fluid velocity u, uh, and they swim, in this case, uh, they're going to swim with a velocity, non-dimensional velocity uh, phi, um, in orientation p. Um, as before, P changes uh, because of the, the flow. So this is the vorticity and the, the rate of strain. Uh, but we also have a restoring force. Uh, so this could be the gyrotactic um, restoring force. So cells uh, tend to align um, in the direction of the K unit vector um, opposite to gravity in this case. 
So we've got two uh, key parameters in this problem, uh, the phi, the swimming speed, and the uh, stability number. So um, the stability number or time scale for reorientation, uh, when psi is large, um, that corresponds to cells taking a long time to orientate in terms of their preferred direction. Um, and alpha is the, uh, again, the, the elongation. So I guess that's the third parameter. Um, okay. So these are some results uh, published in, in the paper, uh, this paper that was published last year. Um, so a couple of results that they found in these uh, direct numerical simulations of turbulence is that as we increase the chain length or the aspect ratio the slender, the about slender cells, they're spending more time in the flow that's transporting them upwards. So UZ in this is the um, components of velocity, fluid velocity upwards. So they're spending more time here um, in the upwelling flow. And they're also finding that slender cells are swimming upwards more rapidly. So if I pick out a couple of points on this, let's say this green square here, um, if that green square is a sphere, alpha zero, um, swim speed seven, and if we look at the elongated rod with alpha is one, um, the vertical orientation, PZ, so the component of upswimming is enhanced. And we wanted again to explore whether we can understand this uh, by looking um, at some simple shear flows to understand it better. Um, so I, after trying to reinvent the wheel, I, I realized I needed to go back to, to nice um, classic work uh, that was published uh, a few years ago by um, Tim Pudley and John Kessler, uh, looking at what the equilibria are of this system. And if you'll have, uh, we're going to restrict attention just to flow in an XZ plane. Uh, so we've got vorticity in the J direction. Uh, and we do need to think of the 3D um, orientation uh, P in this case. Uh, so spherical polars um, with theta being the angle that the cell makes from the vertical, the preferred um, direction. And what they uh, showed was that there ex exists a single stable equilibrium uh, pointing upwards. Um, so it's in the XZ plane with phi being zero, uh, cos theta is positive. And if we're working with horizontal shear, the single stable equilibrium is given by this expression here, provided that psi, our stability number, is less than one minus alpha, so minus one. And if we're working with vertical shear, we have this expression for the um, single stable equilibrium. And there's uh, two slightly different conditions depending on whether alpha is uh, smaller or larger than a third. Um, so as I say, this was well-established uh, results, um, but I wanted to explore them a little bit further. Because it turns out that these equilibrium, um, are, this, the equilibrium is not necessarily globally attracting. Um, so what do I mean by this? Um, I'm going to do it by way of illustration. Um, if we look at vertical shear flow, so the, the vertical flow, then um, we find if we look at doing a phase trajectory in the orientation space, Px and Pz, then we can compute the, the equilibrium states of the system. Um, and they're actually four equilibrium. And this red circle at the top corresponds to the um, stable equilibrium that I showed in the previous slide. Um, so this is the stable equilibrium. Uh, there's a kind of semi-stable equilibrium down here pointing downwards if we only think about 2D and don't have it going in and out of the third direction. Um, but there is also, we see that the, the trajectory is not globally attracting to this stable equilibrium. And we can also have orbits um, provided that our initial orientation Px is to the right of this null cline, um, this Px dot equals zero null cline. So there's some orbits here. So this equilibrium is not globally attracting. If we're in horizontal flow, um, there isn't it, this, the stable is globally attracting. 
And this, this observation about the equilibria not being globally attracting um, was uh, observed and, and published uh, by Morgan Frankel um, uh, some years ago as well. Uh, so now I want to explore what this means in terms of the transport of cells and in terms of the um, uh, accumulation in the vertical. So let's first of all think about how cells are orientated in flows. So if we start by thinking of horizontal flow, um, what I'm plotting here is the uh, horizontal component of swimming, Px, and the vertical component of swimming, Pz. And I'm looking at varying values of the stability number. So increasing the stability number uh, means increasing the time it takes for cells to, to orientate to the vertical, or equivalently, it could be increasing the strength of the shear. Um, and the colour scale, the blue are the spheres, um, and then red, green, black, we're getting increasingly long chains of, of cells, or increasingly elongated. Um, and these bars represent the regions where equilibrium exists. So the spheres have equilibrium provided size less than one, whereas there is a further larger range of existence of equilibria uh, for the non-spheres. And this is from numerical simulations uh, where we've computed the average Px. And what we find is that um, for the spheres, uh, is this uh, line here with reasonable agreement with the equilibrium prediction, the dashed line. And uh, similar-ish for the uh, others, there's a slight dip under, um, but, but it's, a, it's a similar pattern. And what I'd like to highlight in this result for the horizontal shear is the fact that when um, psi is larger than one, we can see there's an enhancement of Pz with uh, elongation. So here we see that the spheres uh, have zero Pz um, because uh, they're tumbling away, they're, they're past their equilibrium, uh, but the more elongated, we have an enhancement and increase in upswimming. Uh, the, pot, the picture down the bottom is just looking at a kind of rose plot of orientation. So this psi is 0 0.5, we're down here where everyone has an equilibrium. Um, and this is the direction of the equilibrium. Psi is 1.5 is split up. This is where, this is the equilibrium um, where they're all pointing a certain direction. Uh, but the, um, this is where we're in spheres and there isn't an equilibrium. So there's more of a distribution of, of angles. Um, vertical shear, uh, there's slight extra complexity with the equilibria. So the dashed line, um, we can find the analytic results of where we don't have that global stability. Uh, so we have in this region here, uh, the dashed line, some cells are orientated in the equilibrium, but others are doing these periodic um, oscillations. Um, so what we see here in the PX is uh, at, well, across all the values of psi, we see that elongation, moving us from blue, red, green to blue, black, decreases our mean Px, um, and generally has the effect of increasing our Pz. Um, and one thing which is slightly interesting, which you don't quite understand, and I, I need to do a bit more work about, is um, here in C, we've looked at the orientation distribution of the cells, which aren't at equilibrium. So at 1.5, if we look at 1.5, uh, the green, red, and blue are all tumbling away, uh, but the black, the most elongated cells, some will be at an equilibrium and others will be oscillating around. And it seems that the oscillating around actually have a, a downwards bias um, in their orientation. Okay, so what's that mean in terms of transport? So if we're in horizontal shear, the average um, velocity or the sort of you know, upwards, upwards movement will only be due to their swimming because it's horizontal flow. So it's just due to their upswimming. Um, and so everything depends on the average Pz. 
So if we look at the PZ for horizontal shear, we see that at small values of psi, psi being less than one, uh, being spherical gives you your maximum upswimming, but only slightly. Whereas for psi going from one through to three, um, being more elongated increases your upswimming uh, because it extends the region where equilibria exist. Now, if you look at vertical shear, um, we've got a com combination of how we get transported in, in vertically. Partly it's due to swimming and partly it's due to transport by the flow. So if we look at the swimming, uh, we see that across the board, um, being long and thin gives you a higher value of PZ. So you, you can swim up better. Um, now this component of UZ, your upswimming velocity, uh, if you were starting from the origin with equilibrium orientation, then your UZ will just be simply, simply linear increasing with uh, PX, your horizontal component of swimming. And so what we see is that across the board, by making yourself longer and thinner, moving down through the blue, red, green, black, um, will decrease your horizontal component of swimming, which will decrease the amount that you're advecting downwards, which obviously will be beneficial and help you move upwards. So it seems from these simulations that, that yes, these mechanisms of simple shear are, are enhancing, elongation is enhancing your transport. Um, it also affects your vertical, the, the, your shape also affects your, the, the distribution. Um, so these are some simulations where we looked at um, Kolmogorov uh, flow, horizontal Kolmogorov flow, um, and looking at increasing the stability number or, or increasing the shear, the, the overall shear. And we started from a uniform distribution of cells, did it as a periodic problem, uh, and looked at how the cells accumulate. So what we see is that there's an accumulation in the uh, this sort of higher shear um, regions. Um, and uh, one kind of pattern for the low uh, shear regime, but as we increase the shear, uh, we found these spikes appearing. So this is a spike of spheres appearing. And then this was a spike of uh, two chain, um, two cell chains, so slightly uh, elongated. And we can understand that by looking at the transition between equilibria and tumbling. So let me try and explain that a little bit. Um, so the first peak um, comes about because of variation in the vertical swimming. So this is the plot that we just saw repeated again, looking at the vertical distribution. Now, the distribution of cells N, just from a simple conservation equation, um, N is changing due to uh, an infection term. And if cells are moving at their equilibrium, uh, it, they would be given by 5PZ, the infection of them. So um, the equilibrium solution to, to this problem will be that an equilibrium N will be inversely proportional to PZ, which is what I plotted here. And you can see there's good agreement between those simulations and this, this predicted equilibrium. Um, and we can understand why there is less variation in the blue, the spheres, than the others, if we look at the behavior back again in, in the constant shear. So if we take psi as 0.5, uh, so kind of a, a line going psi as 0.5 here, then if we look at the spheres, there is less variation in PZ for the sphere going from psi as 0.5 to psi as zero than there is for the non-spheres. There's a bigger variation. And so in our Kolmogorov flow, where the shear goes from psi as 0.5 to psi as zero, there is more variation in the PZ for the elongated than there is for the spheres. Therefore, we see more variation in the um, N equilibrium between the spheres and the um, uh, elongated particles. So that's one place we get the peak. 
Um, the second peak, the more striking peak, is representing the transition between equilibria and tumbling. Um, so for spheres, this was looked at uh, a few years ago, uh, and it's published in this paper here. Um, so what I'm plotting here is a phase portrait of our PX, our horizontal orientation, against vertical distribution. Um, and there's a Hamiltonian for the dynamical system of this, uh, which can be written as follows. Um, and we can look at trajectories of cells in this space. So if a cell down here uh, starts with an orientation, uh, given orientation PX below the red line, then it will follow the trajectory, approach this red line, um, find this, this equilibria equ uh, line, and then travel along it until it reaches the point where the horizontal component of swimming is plus or minus one. So at that point, the cell is reaching an equilibrium which is horizontal. So it's right on the cusp of having an equilibria and tumbling. So all the cells below the red line will tend to accumulate and move towards this um, point here, this blue point, which is where we see the, 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 the peak. Uh, just above this peak, the cells are in higher shear and are tumbling. Um, and then again, a bit higher, higher further, cells are moving towards this red line and accumulate at this blue point. So we see accumulation because we have regions of upswimming at equilibria and regions of tumbling. Now, if I refer you to this, this plot of PZ again in Foucault flow, if we look at this point, psi is 1.5 and the blue line, we can see there's a region between one and 1.5 where cells are tumbling. So that's the, the, the mid range of the, the diagram on the left. And then there's all of this region here where psi is less than one, where cells will be able to swim upwards. So all of these cells can swim upwards and accumulate in this tumbling, the, the bottom of the tumbling zone. Um, and a similar thing happens uh, when we look at non spheres, although we don't have analytic results for that. So here, where we're looking at psi is three and the N is two chains, so two cells stuck together. Um, so when Psi is three, uh, cells down here are going to be moving up and uh, reorientating, reaching kind of their equilibria orientation uh, and tending towards this cusp, at which point their equilibrium orientation is a horizontal and they're almost about to tumble. And if we look again at this diagram on the red line when Psi is three, so we have a region at this highest shear where our cells tumble. And then all of this region um, where psi is less than uh, this, this critical value, uh, there is an equilibria. So all of this region, um, all of this region here, which it corresponds to, the shear is low enough that cells can attain an equilibria and swim up and accumulate. So this is a transition depending on the um, elongation. Uh, and I think it's quite a nice example of where we perhaps get this sort of sorting behavior almost, depending on elongation and which ones can swim up and which ones get rotated around. But I'll be interested on any comments uh, you have on this. Okay, so um, just a final couple of summary and conclusion slides. And as I said, I'm very happy to discuss and take, take questions after this. Um, in the second part, what I've hoped to demonstrate is that many active swimmers are non-spherical um, and that the shape can be quite important. So what we've found is that elongation on the whole improves upswimming. It increases that, that PZ component. Um, it also, it may suppress the migration into the downwelling flow. Um, it decreases the, the, the PX component in our, in our simple shears. Um, and then we found some interesting shape dependent um, formation of shape, shape dependent formation of horizontal layers, which were forming um, due to some vertical variations in both swimming speed um, and these uh, transition between equilibrium and tumbling. Um, one thing I would note is that what I presented today, I've, I've not made any mention about how psi, the stability, and phi, the swimming speed, uh, vary with shape. But of course, they do vary with shape, um, and that will cause uh, you know, extra interest and extra complexity to the problem to make these predictions. 
Um, having said that, I still think it's it's really interesting and worthwhile to, to explore these, these sort of fundamental stripped down problems um, to help us understand um, you know, the, 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 the basics uh, uh, better. Um, so in conclusion of both parts, um, I think it's very clear that shape matters and is interesting. Um, I'd also really like to promote uh, the importance of curiosity driven research. Uh, so um, I think in my sort of research portfolio, as it were, um, I have a really nice, I, I really feel very fortunate that I have a, have a nice mixture of, of work. Some is very, very applied and very focused on, on particular applications um, and other things um, are very much driven by curiosity and, and opportunities that arise from interesting research that I see, um, opportunities that I have try and make for students to, to have tastes of, of research. And, and I think it's, it's really important that we do have fun and, and enjoy that, that curiosity driven research. Um, and I also uh, uh, would like to highlight the value of interdisciplinary collaborations. I think it's really fun to have opportunities to, to meet people working um, from, from other research areas um, and not only to, to get applications out there, but also uh, get some quite fundamental research questions um, you, you end up finding. Um, so that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs>